Good, good. Right, I think we are um, ready Bye. to go. You didn't yeah. mute me, did you? Good. No, good, no. Good. Just double check. Okay. Uh, Karen and Carol are both with us. Yeah, I see Karen on screen. Yep. So great. And Carol's here too, yeah? Carol's here too, yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, good afternoon everyone. So um, I am really delighted to be here this afternoon with this fabulous panel to talk about designing accessible learning content. And uh, for those of you who've been with us all week so far, there's been lots of discussion already about the best way to make progress with accessibility and inclusive design is by working together on it. And um, also very important is approaching the subject from a really person-centred mindset and not just focusing on meeting accessibility standards, but also about creating engaging and exciting digital experiences that include the widest possible audience. And I think we can agree that learning and development is an area where considering how to promote engagement is just absolutely fundamental. But what about this ever growing array of digital tools that we use to achieve this? And how about if some of them are perhaps being designed without taking into account the different ways that people access digital content and the barriers that can quite often inadvertently arise through that. And, um, you know, I think we do hear a lot about what doesn't work and difficulties in determining what's accessible, but how can the digital accessibility community engage with learning and, and development folks and you know really work together to raise awareness of barriers and come up with creative solutions um the topic of unicorns has also come up quite a bit this year and i, I hope susie won't mind me saying i think she's a bit of a unicorn <laughs> in the accessible learning space um, and i'm going to give a little plug to her rather excellent book that was published earlier this year, which is called Designing Accessible E-Learning Content. Oh, so, um, I, you know, it is a really useful read with practical advice and loads of good case studies in there. Um, and so I'm going to hand over to Susie and this fantastic panel to, uh, to get into that discussion. So I'll just start then with a little bit more about me, really. So as, as well as writing the book, um, I'm also an instructional designer. Uh, I've worked in learning and development for, for many years now. And um, I'm also, um, I also um, specialise in e-learning e accessibility, probably I'd say for about the last, I don't know, seven or eight years. I've been really focusing on, on kind of learning and, and looking at, at accessibility in that field. So um, I'm also um, a white woman. My description, um, I'm in my early um, 50s I have grey hair and I'm wearing a flowery shirt I'm sitting in my home office um, in in the UK in near Winchester so that's me and then if I could ask the rest of the panel to introduce themselves so I just have to say first a, a massive thank you really for the, them giving up their valuable time all of the all three of them are, are fantastic advocates of accessibility in our industry so it's a, it's a real honour to have them with us today so I don't know Paul if you wanted to start I had, I'm Paul and I was muted, but now I'm <laughs> no longer muted. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm uh, with Domino. Uh, Domino One is an authoring solution that we provide that enables folks to collaboratively work together and, and build e-learning and hopefully build it as accessible. Uh, we like to describe to folks that accessibility is a journey. Um, it's always just like any good content. It's always, you're always getting better. And uh, we're always trying to improve our product here. So very happy to go ahead and be here. Um, I'm a, a white uh, male that is based here in Denver, Colorado in my home office. Um, it looks dark in the background, but that's because I'm facing a beautiful window and the light is coming in low being winter time here. Fantastic. Should we hand on to Diane? Who's the next one on my screen? 
Certainly. Hi, everybody. I'm Diane Elkins with Artisan eLearning and eLearning Uncovered. And uh, I'm the user of these tools. So I uh, either do custom development through Artisan eLearning or I teach people how to create eLearning uh, through eLearning Uncovered. I've been working in the area of accessibility since 2009, which is interesting that I made it halfway through my eLearning career without even knowing it was a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and have been working ever since to figure it all out. Uh, I'm in my home office in Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, I'm a woman, a white woman in my early 50s. I have red glasses and long brown hair. Sam, over to you. Thank you, Diane, and hello to everyone. Thanks, thanks for having us, Susie. Uh, my name's Sam Cook. I work for Intellum, who make the Evolve authoring tool. I've worked in uh, e-learning QA for uh, the best part of 20 years, specializing in accessibility for the last few years. Uh, I'm a white uh, male, 49 years old, short hair, glasses, and a blue shirt. And I'm speaking from my home office in uh, Brighton on the south coast of England. Wonderful. So I thought maybe the first thing that, that we could talk about today was maybe um, an introduction to our industry, because I think one of the, the, the key things about, about what we do, and we have discussed this before, is the fact that maybe there are, I know there are people here who are involved with learning and development and know very well, you know, who we are, who our industry is, but there's a kind of feeling that maybe in the accessibility um, space that sometimes our industry is, is maybe overlooked and people don't maybe understand quite who we are, what we do, and, and maybe, I think personally, how important we are and and what an important role we have to play in the kind of accessibility um, space. So I, I was trying to find some kind of um, some statistics that will sort of show, you know, who we were. And for me, I think a couple of the things that I found um, really, really helpful was was the fact that how growing, you know, what how our industry is growing, particularly as as a result of, of, of COVID and the fact that so much learning is now online. So I could just found some statistics that um, I'll just read for you now. So I think um, as an industry, we are we have projected growth to be worth about $243 billion by um, 2022 and $325 billion by 2025. So for me that, you know, obviously we don't want to just judge ourselves on how much we're worth, but if we're trying to look at the significance of our industry, I think sometimes when people are thinking about learning, they maybe think that, you know, they, they kind of think, well, we're talking about higher education. Actually, our, our industry just covers, you know, so many different fields or in the public sector, the private private sector, we're just across the range. So any any learning that you've done recently online, we're likely to have a hand in it, whether it's the technology, whether it's the, the learning management system that you find it on, or whether it's actually the content that, that we also produce using the tools that we've been talking about. So that that's my first statistic. And then another one I found, which was which I thought was quite amazing as well, was the amount of people involved. So looking at the um, the user group for, for one particular tool, um, Articulate, which is has um, Storyline and Rise, which are, is one of the, the most popular tools, uh, that has over a million people in it. And for me, that, that was kind of astonishing to think that that, that that was how many people was were within one user group. So I think one of the things that I'd really get like to get across before we start is really just you know how, how what a key players we are and this idea that we have you know an influence over the learning of so many different people. I think that's just vitally important. So I don't know if any of the panel wanted to kind of um, you know contribute to that. If you've got anything, any any statistics or any any kind of personal experiences that you can share on on that theme. I'd like to chime in on that, Susie. It's to me that was a really shocking number as well. Just that million that they just announced that news. Mm -hmm. um, and what's fascinating to me is that such a small percentage of our industry is even talking about accessibility. I think we are an industry that needs to catch up. Um, I have always said that the e-learning world is like the little brother that runs behind the big brother. If you've ever seen the movie, The Christmas Story, A Christmas Story, where, you know, the older kid runs to school and the little kid is running behind. I've always felt like that's our industry catching up to whatever the technology is, the HTML5, the responsive design. And I believe it's very true about accessibility. So the number I wish I had is how many of those million people even know the word accessibility. In our industry, you have to fight to find it. I want a world where you trip over it, where you hear the word accessibility before you hear the word articulate or responsive or gamification. That's the world I want to live in. 
Wait, wait. I just uh, add, I kind of had some of the same experience Diane has, but I have been, there's uh, hope out there. I've actually had a, a few clients where as an organization, that company, and usually they're larger companies, they've started a initiative to everything to be accessible. And, you know, again, it's a journey. And in some of those cases, it's been really rewarding to see that some of the individuals, not all, but some of the folks that are in the e-learning world are actually help leading that because the rest of the organization is very limited as well. So uh, we kind of get caught in our own worlds, but uh, there has been hope to kind of see some of that. And I think it's a lot of the changes that even our industry has had. But again, it's uh, just starting to get the impact it needs. Things definitely are are improving, I would say. I think when I started in the industry, I think we were very guilty of just treating accessibility as a tick box exercise and not really giving it much credence at all. But I, I personally, in the last five or six years, have seen way more tool providers taking it a lot more seriously and a lot more clients making it much more of just a standard day-to-day -day business requirement than it has been in the past. Brilliant. So I think maybe a good starting point to, for, our, for our discussions is really to kind of home in on, on, on why we think it's so important, you know, our own individual perspective of why we think accessibility is so important. And I think just starting with, with my own take on it really and why I'm so you know passionate about it is I just feel you know as an instructional designer working it, it, at, you know the same as Diane working with the tools working in our industry for such a long time just you know that the whole really the purpose of, of what I feel I'm doing is is to enrich people's lives to give them the opportunity to to thrive and to and to learn and for me it just simply didn't make sense to to exclude you know an estimated you talk about the statistics but an estimated 12 to 26 percent of the population just not by not making it accessible so you know it's that that ability for people as I say that the idea of thriving you know whether it's in the workplace whether it's in our education system and also it's it's just that autonomy that you give them so you know we, we talk in, in the UK quite often about about reasonable adjustments for people and it's kind of thinking it, almost as you said, Diane, you know, thinking of this as, as being accessible as the default. So someone doesn't need to say, I need a reasonable adjustment, that every every piece of learning that we're creating, I mean, this is the ultimate goal, is just accessible as the default. And that, and that for me is that, you know, like you're, you're not creating barriers for people, you're allowing everyone the potential to succeed. And, and surely that's the whole point of what we're doing in our industry is, is to make people have those, you know, learning experiences that allow them to, to achieve their potential and to thrive. So any, any, any comments on that? I think I've heard you say in the past, Susie, um, a sentence which really stuck with me, and it's very simple, but it's just, it's the right thing to do. It's a moral choice, so why wouldn't you do it? Yeah, that's a, a great thought. I mean, I've done a number of different presentations on accessibility, and one of my favorite first slides has uh, Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing on there. And um, I mean, one of the things that attracted me to the industry many years ago, besides the technology, was that you know, e-learning and learning there, it really enabled to reach um, so many more people than you could just because of its availability. And then it was a journey for me too. I mean, you if you haven't had a disability or known somebody in there, sometimes you don't realize how many other folks out there that have all sorts of different uh, challenges for accessing or using different tools. And um, some of my first experiences were seeing the separate but equal uh, kind of clause of something that was, you know, quote unquote, and met the accessibility needs. And I looked at it, I thought that was just horrible. Um, not from only a moral standpoint, but just it was ugly. And um, it didn't uh, provide the same experience that the other one. So, uh, you know, from that point, I wanted to make sure that, you know, we continue to do things so it can be great and we squash this idea that if it's accessible, it has to be just boring and just text or something um, and not interactive and engaging, which perhaps was really true at one point, but definitely not true now. Right. Yeah, for me, I need to make sure that as an instructional designer and e-learning developer, I don't make it my job to decide who gets to get better at their job. Mm -hmm. 
That's not my place in the world. It's also not my job to decide who's capable of doing a certain job. That's one of the things I find so often is people saying, well, nobody could do this job if they were blind. Nobody could do this job if they were deaf. Therefore, I, so who am I to decide what somebody can and cannot accomplish in their lifetime, especially with some reasonable um, accommodation? So but what we need to realize, you know, we're quoting movies, now I'm going to quote Pink Floyd, if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. So I don't want it to be my job to decide who can and can't get better at my job. But if I don't take active steps, I have decided. I have decided that there's a group of people who are going to miss out on professional development opportunities. Oh, sorry. The bug just got on my hand. <laughs> Surprise. Freaking out. Okay. It agreed with you. I yes, think we're all nodding. And so very, was the bug. <laughs> very passionate uh, bug about that. So um, I have no idea what I was going to say. <laughs> I completely lost it back to you, Susan. Okay, so um, we'll come back to you, Diane, if you uh, if you if you remember after after the bug incident. I'm sure I'm sure we, when we when we carry on. So I think um, the the next part of the discussion really was was moving on to the the the, the idea that um, maybe things are beginning to change in our industry. So we have a video. Fingers crossed. We're ho hoping the uh, the technical gremlins will be kind to us. But we've got a video from Todd Cummings, who is the chief operating officer of of um, eLearning Brothers who um, have recently um, taken over the Lectora authoring tool. So um, the, the interview with Todd just really touches on, on his perspective of how things are changing, why it's important, why he believes it's important. And then he'll also move on to talk a little bit about um, some of the ways that the, the industry can help, he, how he sees his responsibility in his, his role. And also we'll talk, we'll, he'll, he'll touch a little bit on some of the challenges, both from the kind of authoring tool provider and from the, the 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 learning developer which is what we'll then carry on discussing so as i say fingers crossed we will try and play this video now but um bear with us make sure i have the sound switched on So Diane, I can still see you. If you can give me a thumbs up, if you can see the uh, the video. I can see it. Brilliant, fantastic. So um, hopefully, if I if I carry on playing and again, if you if you just stop me, um, Amy, if you can't hear it, then. Well, then we'll... Uh, welcome everybody and um, thanks very much for joining our session on designing accessible learning content. So it's my absolute pleasure to start by uh, introducing Todd Cummings and I think you're just going to start Todd by giving us an introduction to yourself, your role and your interest in accessibility. You bet. Thank you, Susie. And thanks for the opportunity to be part of this. I you know, wish I could be part of it live. Unfortunately, schedules as they are kind of keeps me from doing that, but I'm grateful to be part of this because Talking about accessibility and certainly the learning industry and technology are things that uh, are very close to me and that, that I love being a part of. I work right now with eLearning Brothers as the chief operating officer. eLearning Brothers is a provider of technology solutions and services here in the learning industry. So we have a great opportunity in my own organization to uh, help move the needle of accessibility down the road a little bit both in technology as well as in learning itself, since we provide both services and products in that. Uh, it's certainly a topic that's fairly close to me. And I think it probably had its uh, origins years and years ago when I worked for Discover Financial Services. And we worked with uh, an amazing woman named Debbie Inkley, who built a, an organization called Boost that brought in people who, who were disadvantaged through a variety of reasons, economic, uh, physical, mental, emotional, uh, learning, whatever the case might be. And she would build classes of anywhere between 10 to 15 of these individuals. And then we would sponsor them inside of our company and we would provide the tools and the resources and such, the facilitators. The courses would last anywhere from six to eight weeks, if I recall correctly. And, and the highlight was, well, certainly the course of the journey itself of watching these individuals progress from from where they were to where we could get them was amazing. But the most uh, life-changing experiences were as we would watch these individuals graduate with a certificate at the end of this course and see the, the advancement that they've made in themselves and to see the confidence that they've built in themselves. Merely by having access 
to skills and and learning that they hadn't previously been exposed to. And so these graduations became celebrations, if you would, as we watch these individuals overcome some of the challenges or not just overcome, but but be provided the means to overcome these technologies or overcome these challenges themselves. And so that was that was something years and years ago that provided me a, a catalyst for wanting to, to be part of this. I, I think for a number of years, it was latent to some degree. And then uh, some time ago, having some interactions with Susie and others really rekindled that. Um, and certainly in the role that I'm at now, a realization that I have a responsibility um, as a leader in my organization and, and hopefully as a leader in the industry to, to do things that will help those individuals that maybe I could say we as technology providers have not allowed for these, these people to discover the opportunities in themselves. And, and so that reawakened this in me. And so that's really, I, I think that that rekindling or re reawakening in me to, to, um, to try and address this and, and help where I can to contribute, uh, opening up our accessibility to so many amazing people that that uh, are limited, not because of themselves, but because of us as technology or service providers. Brilliant, thank you. So I suppose um, I, I'm, and I think we, we both agree that we're beginning to see a little bit, bit of, a, of a change in, in attitudes in our industry towards accessibility. And I think a lot of people now are kind of thinking that, you know, we're maybe working towards uh, accessibility in eventually becoming the default in all all learning content that's a kind of goal that we're, that we're trying to to reach right. so it'd be really interesting to hear your your thoughts on that whether you you yourself as all have also seen the uh, seen a kind of change in attitudes and whether you see that that goal of accessible learning being the the default rather than at the moment kind of being the exception whether you see that's that's a, an ultimate goal that we can reach and, and whether you have a, a time frame maybe of, of when that would be achievable well, speaking to the last first, I, I wish I could put a time frame on it. Obviously, we <laughs> want to accelerate that as we can. But interestingly enough, I do think the pandemic, uh, this global pandemic, has accelerated that for us. Mm -hmm. Because in a sense, all of us have been put at a disadvantage. And so as, as an industry, and really as not just as a learning industry, but as a technology industry, we've been forced to rapidly find solutions to help the greatest number of people that we can learn remotely or digitally. Mm -hmm. So I think in terms of, uh, of a timeline, my goodness, I, I think many of us are amazed at just what's occurred over the course of the last year and a half in, in digital technology and digital learning. And so I don't think it, it, it would be too remiss or, or disingenuous to say, certainly within the next two to three years, I can imagine us seeing tremendous strides that continue to pay, take place. I think as well, uh, this pandemic has, has accelerated certainly uh, the learning industry in the sense that as I go out in the industry now, I'm encountering more and more people who are looking to expand the, their areas of influence and accessibility. I, I think I'm you know, just looking at myself again as I shared my experience of this rekindling in, in myself. I think many folks are starting to recognize that they can do things, whether as an individual or as an organization, uh, to help uh, ensure that everyone has that opportunity to learn. I think recognizing again that it's not it's not these the learners or our end users that, that need this. We all need this because as as world and as communities and organizations as we as we look to lift everyone, our own organizations of self are lifted. Our our world itself is lifted. So I I do think there's an increase in awareness because I do see organizations that are focused on accessibility. You see a multiplicity of organizations that are now focused on um, reviewing websites and seeing how accessible a website is that are building training where they're already integrating uh, standards and requirements, uh, you know, unencumbered by any other regulations out there. They're, they're taking it upon themselves to try and do that. And so I'm really excited that, that I'm starting to see and hear about this movement even more. Um, we're starting to see more and more conferences paying attention to it, more and more of the tools and, and not just authoring tools, but LMS and, and other learning platforms, communication platforms are starting to recognize and acknowledge that. Um, we were actually reached out. We just did an accessibility conference yesterday uh, for a few hours and we were looking for platforms. And it was a little bit challenging to find that some of these platforms don't even have uh, accessibility capabilities. And so we you know, raised the awareness of it, but then we reached out to some closed captioning companies to try and have them. 
all of them were booked because okay. they didn't have the time or the people or the resources to, to, to meet our needs. And I thought, okay. oh my goodness sakes, that's wonderful. Because again, to me, that tells me that as, as individuals and as organizations, we're starting to, to recognize the importance and the value of this. And so it's extremely exciting to me. And I certainly think it's within our grasp. It's got to become, it does have to become our default. I still think uh, for, for many, it's a last thing that they think of. And so we do have opportunity inside of our, our, of our industry to start putting it at the front of our head before we build before we design, before we create, we do it with that in mind, which is how do I make this available to as wide of an audience as I possibly can so that everybody can benefit from this? Um, that's, that's that's kind of what I'm seeing. I'm, I'm not sure if I exactly addressed the, the question <laughs> or thought, but what am I missing? <laughs> yeah, no, no, that was great. Yeah, and especially I loved your time frame of, of maybe two or three years. That was for me, you know, definitely something that we should be aiming for. So accessible is the all learning accessible as the default within maybe two or three years will be a fantastic achievement. So, and as I say, it's great to see that, that you also agree that you've seen that kind of a shift in attitudes and, and a kind of more awareness of, of accessibility. You so that, that, yeah, that really brings us to, to our last question really. And that's sort of looking at it from, uh, from your role really, really as an authoring tool provider. So what we're going to be discussing in the panel a little bit later is kind of the challenges maybe from one side. So maybe as the, as the designer and developer of using authoring tools. And I think we're quite um, familiar, um, you know, in that, uh, you know, in that role of maybe being quite critical of some of the accessibility features that we, or, or the, um, you know, the, the, the availability of some of the, the features in our tools but it would be really fantastic to hear from your point of view as an authoring tool provider you know once once you've learned a bit more about accessibility you realize that there are lots of challenges around it so it'd be really interesting to hear on your side really of uh, as an authoring tool provider what are some of the challenges that, that you've come across when you're trying to make your tool more or more accessible or, or anything to do with accessibility really yeah it's a it's a great one and and, and Susie it's a you know, it's a topic that, of course, as I as I said at the at the top of our discussion, is very critical to me because now I'm in a, in a position of influence where I can influence tools and technologies, and I recognize there is a tremendous opportunity for us because, again, early on in my career, I began to realize that the the amazing people in our world are limited again not by their capabilities, but by the services and the products that we build and produce in the technology industry. So, in a sense we're the ones responsible for not allowing individuals to achieve their highest potential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Conversely then, what a wonderful experience it is for that. So what, what can I do in my tools? What are some of the things that, that we can do? Well, I think one of the things that we, we've got to realize as an industry is it's not just the end user, the learner that needs to benefit, but there are so many capable people out there that we need to make our tools accessible to build in and to develop in and design in. And while I think some of my tools are strong on the end user or the learner, I think there's a great opportunity for it to go in and, and start looking at the designers and the creators themselves. And what are we missing out on by not providing a tool that allows for um, someone that's hearing impaired or visually impaired or, or, or physically impaired to be able to access my tools. Mm -hmm. And so that's things that we're looking at. But there's a lot of limitations um, as well in our industry. And, and while there's a lot of, of focus and money flowing through the industry right now, we still have limitations of time. Mm -hmm. of resources, of technology itself, because unfortunately, many of these tools weren't built with the end in mind, so mm -hmm. to speak, to, to still a, a coveyism. We didn't build with the end in mind. We kind of built for the here and now. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to go back and, and, and either look at reverse design, you know, reverse technology, which is always problematic, mm -hmm. or we have to build the technology from scratch again, you know, foundationally with that end in mind, both of which require time, require expense, require resources, capabilities. Um, and in the world today, those are all, you know, very finite resources, but they're ones that I think as an industry we're looking at, and hopefully, even though I may have my brand and my tools and my technologies, hopefully we don't start viewing this as, well, I don't want to share that because I want to maintain that competitive advantage. The true competitive advantage for all of us is when we open it up for everyone. If we try to maintain that competitive advantage for ourselves and, and, and selfishly hoard the knowledge or the accessible features or things that we're doing with our tools or the advances that we're making, then, we'll, then in a sense, we're losing the competitive advantage because we become uh, you know, a, a self-contained or self-focused shop 
and that doesn't help the learners. It doesn't help the industry. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think those are some of the limitations that we'll have as technology providers um, and, and, as, and, and learning providers, but they're certainly not unachievable or insurmountable. Certainly if other individuals out there have done, have overcome so many amazing things, we as, as technology providers and industry and learning providers can do that as well. So I'm so I'm excited and I'm hopeful. I know I know the learning brothers. We're trying to do some things and and I'm trying to collaborate with a multiplicity of people to say, and you know we've got some feedback that you know we're not doing enough and and we're not maybe taking the right approach. And I'm learning from that. I'm I get I get things wrong sometimes, but I'm so grateful to so many people out there that are giving me feedback and helping me understand what we can do and how we can do it and what we can do better and how we can approach it. And, and uh, I'm, I'm excited to work with those kinds of people that help help me get where we as an industry need to go. So brilliant, thank brilliant. you for that. And you being one of them, Susie. So thank you <laughs> for that. Thank you so much. So I, so think, I think that's a that's great, great start, start, for start, for start, start for us to be able to, um, to, we'll take that into our discussions, what you've been saying. So, and it was, it's so, uh, it's such a great introduction. And, and so, you know, it's so lovely to have someone, uh, you know, who is so behind what we're doing and and really a leader in the industry so thank you again so much for your time and for joining us we really appreciate it okay so, so quite, quite a lot to discuss there <laughs> we did we did say before we started the interview that it would be about five minutes but uh <laughs> Todd had so much good stuff to to, to share that uh, it was it was fantastic to just to, just to carry on. So I suppose um, maybe a, a starting point. So I, I think it was really interesting to hear Todd's take on, on you know on how he saw the industry and how he saw his his responsibility. I, I know certainly from my point of view. I think one of the things that we're very strong at as an industry is, um, you know, that grassroots level. So people, you know, like me, learning designers, learning developers who who realise that how important it is and are very passionate about it. I think from a, that kind of groundswell of people that, that are really, you know, um, committed to accessibility, we're, we're good on that level. I don't think necessarily we've had the leadership before. So that for me was why it was so um, fantastic to have um, um, Todd's view of, of how he sees it sees things so I think moving the discussion on I don't know if anyone wanted to to comment before we we carry on about any any reflections on what Ted Todd said there, there was one item there that um, and about technology and being part of it there one of the things I, I comment on a lot of different things in terms of technology um, it's not as bad as this but it reminds me a bit of when I was first in with the internet, and I didn't mention my age, but I was involved in the first browsers and working with those. And um, if you built tools to create web pages, which essentially e-learning are and stuff, it was incredibly difficult uh, to go ahead and be, because everything was a little bit different and it depended on who used what browser and everything. And um, today, um, fortunately, some of the assistive technologies are not that bad in terms of all over the place. But they're not quite as good as where the browsers are right now, where they're all identical in terms of how they behave on different things. But um, all of it is part of that same ecosystem, and it all has a tremendous impact on the organizations trying to build and add things in. So the good thing is the he's seen that too. I've seen it. The, the level of importance upon organizations has increased, and that's had an exponential effect because all these tools all work together. And if they're all more consistent and they're all better, it makes all the other tools easier to get better too. Um. Diana? I liked what he said specifically about not making it a competitive advantage. And I think that's great on the tool side. And I think it's also good for custom content companies like me. Right now, the fact that we do a lot in accessibility is a competitive advantage and I don't want it to be. I don't want it to be special or unique. I also don't want this book to be required anymore. I love this book. See all my little tabs here? I love this book. I wish it didn't take how many pages? 323 pages to figure out how to do this. You know, I'm writing a course, a self-paced course on Articulate Storyline, how to make a storyline course accessible. And I'm not done. It's 78 pages of just script. I'm not done. Like, I don't want it to, to take that long. So I think there's 
there are some ways that we can just open up everything. It's great that you know you're sharing your knowledge. I know that um, uh, both Paul and Sam have put out a lot in their community of information. And let's not hoard it. Let's share it. Like I can go online to like I have Sam's documentation. I'm not a an uh, evolve user, but I can go and I can read his documentation, which is great. You know, Domino has a community. So the more we can get the information out there and I see it happening, like accessibility is having its day. I've spoken more on accessibility this year than probably the past five years combined. We are having a moment and let's use it. Let's get as much information out there we can while people are being receptive. So I'm, I'm, I love this concept of not hoarding our knowledge. Let's share it. But then let's also move to a day where it doesn't have to be that hard. And a lot of that is on the tool providers. You know, if they can put in a color contrast tracker automatically in their tool, you know, that's just going to make it easier, an easier um, entry into the industry. Brilliant. Thank you, Sam. I certainly sympathize with what Todd was saying about the the economic aspects for us as tool providers. I, I work as part of a very small team. We're all the will is there absolutely to make our content as accessible as it can be and do that development work. But we're always going to have competing business interests, time and money are always an issue. So carving, you know, and, and making accessibility enhancements can be quite laborious, time consuming. There's a lot of trial and error. So just, you know, having the time and budget to, to be able to do that work is, is not always easy. Great. So I think um, it might be worth sort of mo moving our discussion on and, and having a look at some of the um, some of the, the really good things that are happening in tools. Um, and I, as I said, as I said in the interview, one of the things I know that we're very good at as, as learning designers and developers is to uh, maybe critical of, of the tools. And one of the one of the myths that I um, look at in one of the presentations I do is the, is the fact that we say, uh, you know, we can't make an, our learning accessible because we don't have the right tool. So I think it's it's really it's a it's a great start to see what tools are doing at the moment and some some examples of some some really fantastic things so um, if that's okay with everybody I might just share a couple of slides I think it's easier maybe if you can visualize some of the things so this is some of the research that I that I did for the book and if I just show a few slides I think hopefully we'll um, show this so again Sam I can see you now could you just give me a thumbs up if you if, if you can see that uh, that presentation brilliant okay so we're just starting off with the with the overview really of, of these are some of the tools so I think one of the things that, that if you're not familiar with our industry is just really the absolute astonishing amount of authoring tools that, that are available there so on the screen we have um, some um, some logos from different um, tool providers so we've got for example we've got adapt we've got captivate articulate and um, we've got Camtasia um, and also obviously we've got um, evolve and domino and let which are some of the tools that we look at and um, more specifically in our discussion. So as I say, a huge uh, variety of, of different tools. And I think um, certainly one of the things that I found as, a, as an e-learning um, designer and, and developer is, is just the amount of tools now that you, you probably dip in and out of. I think for a long time, maybe people just specialize in one particular tool, but I think uh, across the board now, people are, are kind of are using a, a different range of tools. So um, I think coming back to, for me, what's what's really important, the, the kind of like the, the benchmark of what we should be providing as authoring tools is actually already provided by the authoring tool accessibility guidelines which are actually w3c guidelines which for a long time i had no idea actually existed um, they are very useful there's a whole range of different um, recommendations they make but i think for, for me there are three things that they, they kind of drills down to one of them is making the tools themselves accessible for developers and i think that is something that todd touched on very interestingly and i think that's something that that's often overlooked the fact that you know the tools themselves should be accessible and then also obviously making sure that the authoring tools allow allows developers to, to create accessible content obviously as, as a key one but a really important one for me and I, and i think maybe um see whether whether diane agrees with me is actually the support that that we need as developers in making that content accessible so how to use the tool so um, in the um, 
content that, that you were referencing, for example, um, Sam's content on Involve, that's actually giving you specific instructions. And um, Diane, you were talking about your own instructions, for example, for the for the mm -hmm. Articulate tool. And it's almost that that is, is absolutely crucial for us. So, so who is it that should be providing us that, that, that information? So looking at, for me, these are, as I say, some of the key things that I think are really fantastic in tools at the moment. So, so one, I think of the most important things for me is to have a conformance statement. So on the screen now, you can see an example from the Articulate Storyline tool. And those of us that are trying to meet web accessibility guidelines, whether it's it's for good practice or whether it's for, um, you know, for, for um, legislation such as in the UK, like the public sector bodies accessibility um, regulations, absolutely essential that we know what is and isn't accessible so even if the tool cannot reach meet all of the accessibility principles that's understandable but it's just that information and that easy reference to to finding out what is and not what is and what isn't accessible so really really key for me um, another one is supporting documentation. So um, I've got an example here from Xerti Online Toolkits, which kind of goes one step further than I would say kind of the, the guidelines that you normally see. And it actually breaks down how um, different content types can, can help people with, with different access needs, which I think is really valuable. Then um, interactive components. So uh, coming back to um, the, that um, comment from Paul about the fact that people often think that uh, accessibility learning has to be boring actually a lot of interactivity in the tools is accessible and we can use it but it's really helpful if you're a, de a developer to know quickly and easily what is and what isn't what you need to avoid and what you can use rather than having to dig into forums or you know or always find out so an up-to-date list on what is in accessible interactivity in your tool is really really helpful so another thing that i found when i was doing my research um tools that are offering um, kind of automatic accessibility so, so not there's no magic tick box but for example um this we have an example here from um course arc which shows a drag and drop um, uh, activity which if you if you insert that into your learning it will automatically provide you an accessible alternative which is um, a multiple choice option so you know that then you're not having to think too hard about uh, accessibility Another one is an accessibility checker. So the example on screen is from the Lectora authoring tool. Um, those of us who are familiar with using accessibility checkers, for example, in, in Word or in, in um, our PowerPoint presentations know just how, how useful this can be. Um, an example here from Evolve, um, a, 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 an example of actually having accessibility built into the workflow. So you have an example here of when you're adding a video. If you um, tick the box that says um, allow this to play automatically, then you can see that you have instructions that say actually that will be a problem for you both from the um, Section 508 um, regulations and also WCAG regulations as well. So really, really helpful to have that inbuilt as you're designing and developing in the tool. And then we have an example as well from Domino One. And again, I think Domino One is also, and um, Paul, you can comment on this, very key for them is, is having that accessibility in the workflow. So it's not an, an extra thing that you have to do at the end. But this example on the screen here is looking at um, WCAG compliant themes. So if you have a range of, of design themes for your um, in the tool, a beautiful example of, of very clear labeling of which ones are WCAG compliant so that you know automatically up front which ones to choose. And then finally, something from Lectora, a uh, frustration um, in, in some tools is that the characters, those of you that are familiar with e-learning characters that come up and, and provide some um, interest for you as, as you're going along. Some people like them and some people aren't so keen, but to have um, diverse diversity there and inclusive characters. So we have um, on the screen here an example of a, a Lectora character who has a limb deficiency and they are um, characters that have quite recently been introduced into the, the character range. So visible disability is kind of something that, again, for me, it, it seems like a very small thing, but actually for me, that's a very significant achievement in our in our industry to actually um, acknowledge that and, and have that as a standard. So those are some of the things that, that I found that I think are very helpful. And Diane, I don't know if you want to, um, as, as, as your, your role as the, the de designer and the developer, is there anything that, that you can add to that that you find very helpful. Um, I I learned accessibility on Lectora and having that accessibility checker was a great feature and it's not something that I have in other tools. But we also need to make sure that as designers we don't rely too much on the tool. 
Mm -hmm. uh, a tool can tell me if I have alt text. A tool can't tell me if it's good alt text. Mm -hmm. And there's so many things that it just it just can't check. So we, we really need to be partners as the designers uh, with the tools. And the other thing that is really valuable to me is anything that makes it quicker, because it's not just about me and my time, but it's, you know, we're trying to influence an industry to do this thing that feels hard and scary and expensive. And so anything that a tool can do to make it faster. So I've been I'm, I'm on the, the beta team for um, Storylines Accessibility and I'm constantly sending them features and some is based on feedback from a learner that you know they found this confusing. But part of it is what's gonna make my job easier to set it up? Little things like their focus order dialog box. I can drag and drop and put absolutely custom fo focus order, which is great. But let me select more than one at a time because otherwise I'm going drag up, drag up, drag up, drag up. Like little things like that that make my job easier. It's going to make it an easier sell to the industry if it can stop being um, hard and time consuming. So yes, we need to care about the output, but anything we can do to make the process more efficient, anything that can be built in. So for example, uh, Lectora, um, eLearning Brothers, Articulate come with pre-made templates. Well, the templates don't have any accessibility set up. Well, why not? I mean, they're providing the templates. So why not have them accessible? Now I can still mess it up. I can, you know, when I add my content, that doesn't mean I'm done, but why not at least start me there? So master slides, just anything that's pre-made, why would I have to go back and retrofit all of that? So that's a, an area that I'd love to see. Now, when you've got tools like um, uh, with Domino and with Evolve, with Sam and Paul, their tools are uh, very different from Lector and Storyline, where those are more blank canvas, where they've got very template-based tools. Um, and there I'm using the word template in a different context, where everything you build is from a template, not, hey, I get to use this template if I want, or I have a blank screen template-based tools. And in my opinion, the template-based tools just make it so much easier to be accessible right out of the box mm -hmm. because they've done so much of the programming for the interaction themselves. Like Tora Captivate Storyline, I'm setting up the triggers. I'm setting up the button. I'm making that button. I'm telling that button what to do. So I have to bring a lot to the table. Tools like um, Domino One and Evolve and Rise that are template-based, they've done that work for you and they've made it accessible. So that style of tool, if you want an easier um, access uh, point into making accessible content, that type of tool really helps a lot. So I'd love to see ways that the, the more screen-based tools can act more like the template-based tools. Brilliant. So I think that just leaves us, um, it leads us on to, uh, to the next segment, which is really um, coming back to the, the authoring tool providers and getting your perspective, because I'm sure you, as, as we were talking, I'm sure you are, you know, you have been, you know, people have, have said to you, oh, I should be more, we should be doing this. So I think for me, it's, it's, it's what, you know, what are the, what are the challenges for you as, as authoring tool providers? I think we talked about, you know, the resources, Sam, you, you said about the, the, the time, et cetera. What are the, you know, from a, from the point of view, obviously in the context of, of being in this, in this environment and in this, in this fantastic, um, you know, this conference, from the technology point of view, is there anything that, you know, you, you, you for example, for, for me, looking at the wider, you know, what's going on when you were saying, um, Diane, about, you know, the, 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 the little brother following the big, big brother, you know, if you're looking at the technology and you're looking at the, the most incredible, you know, advances in, in, in technology and, and accessible technology, for me, it seems that we're still kind of lagging behind in some ways. So uh, uh, um, one of the, the the issues that comes up a lot when we're discuss, discussing um, accessible learning content, for me, it's amazing that we're still discussing drag and drops you know that we're, we're kind of obsessed by you know I, I hear that so often people saying well I can't make it my drag and drop accessible therefore you know it can't be you know interact so it's it, it's not obviously that's just one example but you know from your point of view um, um as tool providers what are some of the things that that you think that maybe you know wider than our our our, our particular industry that that could be you know people could help us with or, or it would be beneficial to you not not just saying that you need help but is there anything where where you think that 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 is you know somewhere something to consider well for me um I really I saw two things that really struck home there one is 
from the the uh, authoring tool guidelines. And one of the things when we were looking at that that we felt was really lacking across tools was um, that it was it aided them. And of course, there was always documents you could find. And Diane pointed out a few ones I took some notes on that I'm like, we need to add some things that are a little bit like that too. But it's actually having in the workflow. So this is not an add on. And all the tools I've gotten better that I've seen too. But in the past, it was you had to open up special windows. And so it was like three extra clicks to do anything accessible. So why would you? Um, so one of the things that we did at Domino's made it front and center available all the time. Um, and then as you're adding in something, we used to have a document that it had all the help and you could read, but of course no one read it there or they tried to find it there. So we, we broke that up. And then as you're working on an image or as you're working on any other thing, it's giving you the hints about that particular thing when you're working on it. Because again, not all of it is an on off. You can't just run the checklist. You have to, as Diane pointed, you have to write good text there, but it's reminding you about key things in there. And then when you forget things like to add in alt text, to have little warnings, just to uh, put that up there. But even on the QA side, um, not everyone's an expert in QAing this, but a lot of us could you know, easily QA, hey, did we add in alt text? Um, but right now, you have to look at code most of the time and no one's gonna do that. So exposing that with just a little button where people can view that, is it focused for look at that text? And so those were some of the starts of things that we were doing in the workflow. And actually Diane's comments about templates uh, in one hand, it's kind of gratifying that she uh, that impression because a while back and actually our tool is an open slate and you can do anything on there. But one of the things that we started a while back, not for accessibility, but it was a fringe benefit was to make it easier for everyone to get up and running. And so we added in, so front and center, you start out with templates and we push that to make it a lot easier for folks. But that has also enabled us to start to add more of the accessibility into templates. Um, but then even have WYSIWYG do whatever the heck you want type questions but then add in some more wizard or controlled questions where we can control the environment a little bit more, which makes it great for all types of environments and different devices. But also one of the things too is now we can go ahead and take something like an ordering question or a matching question, which traditionally is more difficult to make it accessible and just build that in so they don't have to think about that. Um, so those are some of the things that we've looked at and we've seen other folks do too as well that I I'm excited about how the industry is moving. Sam, did you? I think Paul makes a good point um, about, you know, documentation is great and it's essential to have it, but not everyone is going to read through a 30, 40 page document. What we've done is we've actually, um, we've made courses in Evolve that anyone who's got Evolve can download into their instance. And that shows you all our interactions and how best to configure them to make them the best accessible experience they can be. So you have that as a starting point in your tool to then start building content yourself. And we have actually made an accessible uh, drag and drop interaction. Uh, <laughs> the car drop Hallelujah. <laughs> it's fully keyboard accessible and you can do things like add uh, custom ARIA labels for the interaction as a whole to give instructions to users. There are ARIA labels for the, for the drop zones so people can understand how they're sort of navigating it. But that kind of practical hands-on advice so they're in the tool learning how to use it as they're educating themselves about accessibility i think is is a good time saver and we've definitely tried to follow that philosophy of having all the settings you need for accessibility there when you're creating the content you're not navigating away to other places to to have to do it it's more there it's part and parcel of any other part of the content creation mm -hmm. oh, i don't know some great points um amy i don't know if we had i know i can see that the, the conversation uh, the the chat's been uh, very active so, Busy, yeah. Uh, yeah so <laughs> is there anything that you wanted to pull out obviously yeah uh, uh let's grab one so this is uh quite a, a a big question here darren says when will critical accessibility qa testing be incorporated by all tool providers in their development cycles uh, some tool providers employ accessibility specialists, but much more needs to be done. Well, that's that's literally my job title. That's what I do all day, every day. I'm I'm testing not just for accessibility, but every aspect of testing, and that's just an absolutely crucial part of our development process. Um, yeah, and I add sorry, that uh, I've seen that with other tools too. I mean, ourselves too. That's part of our development process. And just to give a perspective, I uh, 
worked for an LMS company uh, years back. And of course, accessibility wasn't there. And it was definitely an add-on that was thrown in there. And this was true not only for the LMS, but also the authoring tools that we worked with. So um, it definitely is moving in the right direction for sure. And for the most part, it seems like it is part of that process. Uh, but like anything else, uh, bugs escape th those groups and everyone else too, just like it does for any feature in there too, unfortunately. Sure. We've got one from Bryn here saying an up-to-date list of accessible component patterns for building content per tool would be very cool. Has anyone done that sort of uh, bringing together? I'm seeing some nodding. One thing that's challenging about that is um, quite honestly, taking the word of the tool provider. Um, my Most of my experience is with Storyline for accessibility and, and I love it. I love them. I love their commitment to it. Lots of many good things to say, but some of the tools that they say, some of the features of their software that they say are accessible, I don't find to be true. So for example, they have two versions of a matching question. One involves dragging and one involves drop-down menus. And the drop-down menus is designed for full keyboard accessibility. I can't get it to work. So, you know, even a list, any list you see out there, you nothing replaces your own testing. I'm, I'm always encouraging clients to, to do their own QA and also just encouraging clients to find out as much as they can specifically about their audience and what their requirements are. Because the more you know about your audience, obviously, the more you can tailor your content to, to meet their needs. And I mean, there's no excuse not to be testing yourself. The main screen readers, for example, NVDA, anyone can download it and use it. JAWS, there's a demo version anyone can use. So I really encourage clients to do their own QA as well. Yeah, and I would add, um, and fortunately, it seems to be less of what Diane has seen there, but I definitely have seen that. And you have to bend that answer in like eight angles to be actually true. Um, but in other cases, um, there's different ways to go ahead and do it. And um, what was tested by the vendor may not be the tools you're using. So, you know, tested there. That's why my reference to, it's still a little bit of the wild west and different tools behave mm -hmm. differently and how they interact with that tool and the HTML. So, you know, please continue to provide feedback. I think all vendors want that in there and providing the spirit. So in other words, explain what you were doing so they can replicate it and hopefully resolve it too. And we yeah, also need to look at the difference between compliant and usable. And that is also from an instructional design standpoint. So if someone cannot read my screen and is having to use a screen reader and therefore having to remember my matching question items and i have 10 items on one side and 10 items on the other well if i can see and read i'm going back and forth and back and forth and deciding and looking at those items again if i can't see i have to keep all of that in working memory like that's right. just i don't care if you can use a screen reader to make the question function like you're gonna have smoke coming out of your ears <laughs> so you know yeah, we can look at the tools, but it starts with good instructional design as well. Compliant and, and, and great, helpful are not the same thing. The great thing about that, Diane, too, is that you look at that and you have to ask yourself, is that really even set up good for anybody, you know, <laughs> there or cognitive uh, disabilities yeah. there, too? Or just a normal person having to look back and forth, is it really accomplishing it? And sometimes we get wrapped up in it. So I, I love it as a, ni a nice check for our overall design and that approach of, you know, hey, is it not just check the box, but is it really usable, just like you would for anything else? I think that that comes back, but for me, that makes me think of, of something that I've seen like a theme throughout the, the conference really is, is that idea of empathy. So <clears throat> one of the things that I do, I do a lot of auditing of, of um, you know, different learning content to, for from an accessibility point of view, and obviously seen, you know, some great examples and, and some not so good ones. And I think the, the, the key thing that stands out for me is as the reason why accessible learning is, is automatically better is because you can just see that there is empathy the person who's created that that instructional design you are thinking about 
the, the whole range of learners that you're that you're using it really makes you kind of re unlearn and relearn everything you do as an as as an instructional designer because you really have got to have your learners at the center you know if you're thinking about accessibility you're thinking about different a whole range of different abilities so uh, as i say without a doubt if i you know when i see accessible learning i can just see that empathy i just think it's always a better piece of learning when when someone has made it accessible and that comes back to to your point diane about the usability of it i think as well edwin has uh, brought up a couple of points in the chat um she's saying here i feel that the authoring tools are really moving on this now it's the digital learning designers that don't have accessibility in mind or not all of them and she finds herself having to explain wicag when they ask them to tender how can we influence that? And is there groups like CIPD that could be really pushing this harder? I don't know if anyone's get, or got any ideas there. Well, I can see we're at 4.30, naughty, naughty timekeeping. But I think maybe we've got a little bit of time to just ask that question because I think it's quite a powerful one. I think there's a huge area for our industry to advance in terms of the visibility of accessibility. Right now, you can graduate with a master's degree in instructional technology and barely utter the word accessibility. Um, and so I want it to be at, you know, main stage in every conference, not that back room where 20 people showed up as opposed to the rooms where 200 people showed up, you know, it, and it shouldn't be separate sessions, you know, every session. Yeah. Could have an accessibility component, every article that's out there, every master's program, every, everything is, it is not woven into our culture. It is a fringe group that people either feel they belong to or they don't. One of the changes that I've made is I'm stopping using the word accessibility because it comes with baggage and I'm talking about access. And I'll ask a client, do you wanna make this course accessible? They have preconceived notions. Instead, I say, how can we make sure that everybody can access this professional development opportunity? And they just listen differently. We've gotta make it mainstream because right now let's be really clear, it is not. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, right, I suppose we'd better wrap up. I could talk for another hour on this. It's been absolutely fascinating. I'm just going to sort of pull a few. One of the things I, I scribbled down was that, you know, accessibility is having a moment in, in L&D and let's really grab that moment and do everything we can to to sort of drive that forward and, and I think knowledge share has come up repeatedly throughout the organization and that's not a matter of some people share knowledge and everyone listens it needs to go in every direction uh, Paul if you find a problem don't moan about it to somebody unconnected explain the problem so it can be replicated and fixed and the, and also the more of us that are reporting issues and and spending time in these beta groups and on forums, the more you know, the, the more likely we are to see things resolving. So, you know, um, we said at the beginning, how can we bring uh, L and D into the accessibility community and vice versa? I think it, it's just got to be through communication, conversation, and knowledge sharing, and not considering it to be a competitive thing. This is something that we can all benefit from, but we'll only be able to do it at speed if we work together. Remember, we've got only two or three years, according to Todd. So, we, you know, we've yeah. got, to, got to get our Crack seat. on. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much to our wonderful panel and everybody for listening today. I wish we could have got through more questions as well. Uh, but um, I'm sure we'll be wrapping up with some blogs and so on. And we will ask these lovely people maybe for some extra comments to, to slot into those and enjoy the rest of the conference uh, and uh, yeah, I shall say goodbye.